My name's Associate Professor John Eden. I'm a director here at Wirria and I'm a reproductive endocrinologist, which means I'm a gynaecologist that specialises in hormones. And uh, today I'm going to talk about polycystic ovary syndrome. To begin with, I hate the term polycystic ovary syndrome. I think every hormone doctor does. Um, unfortunately, the name was, uh, was thought of over 200 years ago and we're stuck with it. It conjures up so many negative images. Um, often patients come in very upset, crying, saying things like, oh, my ovaries are full of cysts, I'm gonna get ovarian cancer, I need to have an operation, my ovaries give me terrible pain, uh, and this PCOS is causing the pain. I hate to tell you, but none of those things are true. Right? The appearance of the ovaries um, actually is, well, in this day and age, is an ultrasound uh, diagnosis. Um, basically, the little follicles or eggs line up a bit like a pearl necklace, but it actually doesn't hurt the woman at all. It's really a sign for a woman whose periods, do, uh, if you like, behave in a different way to other women. Um, back in the 90s, uh, researchers took ultras ultrasound machines out into the community and scanned thousands and thousands of uh, healthy women all over the world, asked questions about how often you get your periods and collected data about how easy it was to get pregnant. And cutting a long story short, they found that one in four women have polycystic looking ovaries on ultrasound all over the world. Isn't that remarkable? Doesn't matter whether it's Africa, Australia, America, Europe, one in four, one in four, one in four. So the first thing is having polycystic ovaries is extremely common. And for about half the women, they have no symptoms at all. The ovaries are just harmlessly sitting there. So what does it all mean? Well, it turns out that women who have this type of ovary, if you like, seem to ovulate uh, in, according to different factors to the woman who doesn't have polycystic ovaries. The, the way I often explain it is it goes back to our hunter-gatherer background. Uh, basically, if you think about it, the hunter-gatherers were wandering around as a tribe, and if you came to an area where there wasn't much food and everyone's losing weight, you don't want a lot of babies being born because there's not much food. Well, it turns out as women lose weight, the, the, the women who happen to have polycystic ovaries start to ovulate more regularly and the ones who are normal, who are losing weight, start to stop ovulating. That's the anorexia story. And then, of course, if the tribe goes somewhere else where there's a lot of food and everyone's putting on weight, the, the PCOS women tend to lose ovulations, whereas the ones who need their fat to ovulate start ovulating regularly. So if you look at it like that, it's really a variation of normal. And I've been saying that for 30 years. So the first thing is, if you have had a scan and a doctor's diagnosed you with polycystic ovaries, don't worry, don't freak out. It, it doesn't mean you don't need to have an operation, you're not gonna get ovarian cancer, you're not gonna get painful ovaries. It's really just a marker for a woman who behaves in a certain way, which I'm gonna describe next. So one in four women have polycystic ovaries, about half will have symptoms. And the ones who have symptoms we call polycystic ovary syndrome, or often abbreviated to PCOS. So what are the symptoms? Well, uh, the current definition requires two of three symptoms. Uh, you can have polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. You can have irregular periods or not get your periods uh, for say six months. And the last one is have evidence of too much male hormone. Uh, that could include facial hair, acne, scalp hair loss, or maybe a raised testosterone on a blood test. You need two out of three. So you actually don't need to have ultrasound evidence of polycystic ovaries. You could have irregular periods and say a raised testosterone. Um, so that's the current definition, but I should add, it does also require excluding other things. Because as I've already said, one in four women have polycystic ovaries. So it's so common, you're allowed to have that and maybe a thyroid problem or have um, a pituitary problem. So the woman who presents to her GP with irregular periods, even if the GP finds polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, it's actually very important to do a full hormone profile to make sure she hasn't got more than one thing going on. So the, the average uh, patient I see who has polycystic ovary syndrome usually comes along complaining of, of two or three main symptoms. Her periods have become irregular, uh, she's often put on weight, and uh, depending on which part of the world you're from, if you're from the Mediterranean, you may notice facial hair. If you come from a more Asian background, it, it's often acne. 
and a smaller number of women may actually have scalp hair loss, which is very distressing symptoms. Studies done a long time ago show up something like one in eight women will have excess hair on their face and other parts of their body, and of course they hate it. Uh, uh, a few weeks ago I was asked by uh, a researcher, you know, how common are these problems? Is it even worth researching it? And I said to them, just have a look how many laser hair clinics are around. They're everywhere. Um, there are thousands and thousands of women spending thousands and thousands of dollars on laser hair removal, and often they're not told we actually do have effective drugs for treating these symptoms, which by the way cost about $12 for a couple of months. Quite cheap treatments. So. Weight gain, my periods have become irregular, and excess hair, scalp hair loss, acne. Um, some tests will be done. It's not necessary to do an ultrasound. Uh, I often don't do an ultrasound, especially in young women, because to do the ultrasound properly, you've got to put a probe in the vagina. Yes, I said vagina. And you know, if you're a 14-year-old virginal young woman, you don't want a transvaginal scan, and you don't need to have one. So uh, if a doctor suggests that and you don't want to have it, you don't have to have it. We can actually diagnose polycystic ovary syndrome on blood tests. And again, I won't go into great detail, but obviously we measure testosterone and there's a few other things we measure. Um, and it, but the doctor can actually get all the information they need from a blood test. As part of the workup, I always do a test to look at blood sugar and insulin because we do know that insulin has a big part of the story, is a big part of the story. Um, when we get the test back and we've excluded other causes of irregular periods, so there's no adrenal causes, the thyroid's okay and everything's okay, the story is just polycystic ovary syndrome. The single most important thing is actually lifestyle. It's not drugs, it's lifestyle. And we've known this for a very, very long time. Uh, carbs are the enemy. Basically, every time you eat sugar or carbs, your insulin goes up and it's the high insulin that acts as a break on the cycle and slows the periods and also disturbs the balance between male and female hormones. And yes, insulin is a fat promoting hormone. So it's, yeah, it's really not the ovaries that are the fault, it's actually insulin. You see why I really don't like the name. The poor old ovary gets blamed for all this and the ovary's not the problem at all. So if you reduce your carb intake, and my usual advice is Try and not have more than, say, a third of the meal as carbs. Um, so, you know, it means you may have more protein, more vegetables, uh, more fruit. Um, some of the sneaky carbs are things like bread, pasta, rice, noodles, and potatoes. You'd never guess that jasmine rice, for example, is worse than having a can of sugar, like a can of Coke. Uh, it actually is, is worse. And uh, the way you can work this out is by looking at what's called GI, or glycemic index. I haven't got time to go into great detail, but I really encourage you to do a bit of research online about GI. Our CSIRO here uh, in Australia has done some fabulous work around diet. I'd encourage you to look at their books and download all the materials on, um, on uh, proper eating habits for polycystic ovary syndrome too. But, but in the end, it's try and not have more than a third of the meal as carbs, and where you can, you have low GI carbs. A good example is rice. Um, uh, sugar has a, has a GI of 100, which is obviously very high. Uh, jasmine rice is about 120, whereas the brown rices like basmati are only 40. So choosing basmati rice over jasmine rice is going to make a profound difference. But portion size is also very important. Uh, you've got to keep it down. Don't, don't eat a lot of carbs. Uh, that's very, very important. Of course, you end up eating a very healthy diet then, high in fruit and vegetables and protein all the things that really everybody's meant to eat. And this will also lower your risk of heart disease and diabetes in later life. The second most important thing is physical exercise. Moving muscle lowers insulin. We still don't know why. Uh, I know my diabetes colleagues would like to know why too. And the person who actually works out why moving muscle lowers insulin will probably win the Nobel Prize in medicine. But the more you move your muscle, the lower your insulin goes. And again, studies have shown very limited, even just two or three hours a week of walking can often substantially lower insulin. Now obviously, the more vigorous the exercise, the lower the insulin. And uh, we now have uh, uh, people like exercise physiologists, physios, personal trainers who are very knowledgeable about this. And so I encourage my patients to you know, seek out 
you know, uh, maybe a personal trainer or an exercise physiologist to give them some specific uh, exercises to do. But I'll, I'll actually take any movement at all. Any movement will help lower the insulin and that'll help with weight loss and helping to regulate the periods. Now you may be surprised to learn that modest changes in diet and modest changes with exercise, about half of women who, who aren't, aren't ovulating will start ovulating again. So what I mean is if, you have, if we have say 100 patients who have polycystic ovary syndrome, who only have one period a year or two periods a year, and you get everybody to go onto a low GI, you know, low carb diet like I was describing, and, and modest exercise, half of them will start ovulating regularly. I, I still find that remarkable. Uh, such a simple lifestyle change, half the women will start ovulating regularly. And, and often they'll start ovulating before they've lost any significant weight. Now the third option is a drug called metformin. And uh, uh, many of you have probably heard of metformin. It's been around for a very long time. It's a drug that was invented for diabetes. It's a, it's a wonderful drug. It's uh, actually a plant-based drug. Uh, it's a bit of a curious drug too because we still don't completely understand how it works. But we know it's very good. It blocks sugar, lowers insulin, encourages weight loss, and it's very safe. And in this situation, if you add metformin to healthy diet and exercise, that 50-50 ovulation goes to about two-thirds start ovulating, which is, which is a fantastic result. Um, the residual third, uh, if they want a baby and they're not ovulating, we actually have uh, two oral fertility drugs that are highly effective, and after that we have injectable fertility drugs. So as you can see, we have a lot of treatments. Um, I should pause and just point out, a lot of the women I talk to have picked up this urban myth that because I've got polycystic ovaries, I can't get pregnant. Oh, don't believe that one. I've seen a lot of, uh, unfortunately, unwanted pregnancies where a woman was surprised to fall pregnant when she thought she wouldn't fall pregnant. Uh, as I said, you know, if, if, if you just change your diet, you could just start ovulating like that. And if you happen to be having um, intercourse, you can fall pregnant. Um, most of my PCOS patients have very little trouble falling pregnant, actually. Of course, a lot of women don't want to get pregnant, uh, but want to get fit, they want to lose some weight, and they want to get rid of the facial hair and some of the, uh, these other manifestations. Uh, now, most women know that the contraceptive pill is a very good treatment for acne. And we actually have a number of pills designed uh, for women with acne. The original first one was really a one called Diane, and there's now lots of generic Dianes. I don't prescribe Diane much anymore because it's a rather strong pill by modern standards. Very good pill for acne, uh, but it, women tend to put on weight. And who wants to put on weight in this situation? No, thank you. And they, they can't, some women get quite, in, quite sore and large breasts with Diane. We have lower dose pills, uh, which largely have replaced Diane these days, uh, Yaz and Yasmin. Uh, and these two pills are very, very helpful for women who have uh, acne uh, with or without excess hair. Uh, However, a woman who has well-established excess hair, they usually need more than just a contraceptive pill. And the good news is we actually have a number of drugs that are actually very, very effective for reducing excess hair. Uh, probably the easiest one to use is called spironolactone. It's been around for a very long time. It's another one of those strange drugs that was invented for this purpose and found to be good for something else. Uh, spironolactone was invented as a diuretic to get rid of excess water. And uh, when it was given to men and women who had puffy hands and feet, the men started losing their facial hair, their skin got really nice, and the hair on their head started regrowing. And uh, you know, obviously their doctors went, what is going on here? And when it was researched, it turns out that spironolactone actually blocks male hormone, and it's highly effective. Uh, it's also cheap, costs about $12 for 100 tablets. Uh, takes a while to fully work, uh, you can use spironolactone on its own. Uh, it's definitely more effective if you use it with a pill. And so, so uh, for example, a woman who has well-established excess hair, you know, someone who has a full beard, you know, hair across the chest and back, uh, a, a pill like Yaz or Yasmin combined with aldactone over a period of six to 12 months uh, is often a fabulous treatment. What, what the drug actually does, think of it like retraining the hair follicles. So the hair doesn't drop out. Basically, um, it, it, once the woman's been on the, on the treatment for about three months, it's often a good idea to do some sort of formal hair reduction, whether it be laser or, or electrolysis. And as you remove the hair, the regrowth gets thinner and lighter each time. 
So it's not that the, these drugs don't make hair fall out like chemotherapy or something like that. They actually make the hair go back into a more feminine hair. And uh, they're very effective. Uh, something like 80% plus will get a good result over a year or two. We have a stronger drug called cyproterone that I don't use very much, but it's a fantastic drug for women who have severe acne. And um, um, again, back in the 90s, I think I wrote up a series of women who failed Rakuten twice. Some of you probably heard of Rakuten. It's the wonder drug for acne, and it's a fabulous drug for acne. Something like an 80% success rate. Um, well, I, I see the poor women where Rakuten doesn't work. Uh, and in this particular series we wrote up, uh, the women had failed two courses of, of Rakuten and still had the horrible acne, uh, the mask of acne, the whole face covered with acne, pustular acne across the, the chest and back as well. And uh, that's where Diane with Cyproterone is very, very effective. Um, that don't have to use it for a long time, often just three to six months, and then they can go into something lower dose such as Yaz or Yasmin. So I hope you're getting a sense that a lot of these problems that many, many women think they can't be treated, they actually can be treated actually quite simply, and they're very, very effective treatments. Scalp hair loss, uh, it's probably the least common of these uh, problems, but uh, it certainly happens, and I would see two or three a week in my practice. Um, it's, it's a complex topic and I can't go into great detail. It's not always due just to polycystic ovary syndrome. There's definitely genetics involved. And in fact, in our twin study in the 90s, we looked at the inheritability of, uh, heritability of um, sort of how male hormone works in the hair. And it's, uh, it's almost 100% genetic. So if you look around, uh, girls, if you look around your family and the boys are going bald in the 30s, um, you probably should look to uh, see someone about your own hair early on because uh, typically families who get what's called androgenic alopecia or male pattern baldness, uh, sometimes called, in women called female pattern baldness, uh, they get a, a receding hairline like men, their hair gets very thin and the treatments I've outlined are actually very effective for them too. So things like Yaz, Yasmin, uh, uh, spironolactone, these things are very effective. We even have another drug called finasteride, um, which came out of prostate research. Of course it did. <laughs> Seems crazy, doesn't it? A prostate drug that helps with uh, regrowing hair. But uh, these drugs are safe and very effective. And obviously the earlier the treatments are started, the better the results are. With hair loss too, um, nutritional factors are very important too. Um, iron deficiency is a powerful aggravator of hair loss. And uh, CSIRO has shown that many, many Australian women are iron deficient just from having heavy periods. And uh, if you find yourself really dropping hair a lot, uh, get your iron level checked, it's likely to be iron deficiency. And correcting the iron deficiency stops the dropping usually within a month or so. But uh, things like zinc deficiency can cause it too, underactive thyroid. So a woman who's losing hair should start by seeing a GP and getting a few blood tests done. And if she's getting the sort of male pattern uh, receding hairline type baldness, uh, she should seek out specialist attention because there are drugs to treat that. I might just mention in passing there's quite a few causes of hair loss, they're not all hormonal. Uh, there's an, another type of hair loss uh, called alopecia areata, which where the women get like a patch, um, uh, like, it's almost like punched out, the hairs, there's no hair in that one circled area and that is a dermatological condition which is very treatable too by my dermatology colleagues. So just to summarise, um, if you've been diagnosed with polycystic ovaries, don't despair, right? And uh, you're actually a, a normal woman whose who's family basically ovulate best when thin. That's really all it means. But it's very, very important to get your, your lifestyle right. Most important thing is to maybe even see a nutritionist, spend some time understanding what, about carbs and getting rid of carbs as much as you can. You've got to have some carbs. I mean, even uh, vegetables and greens have carbs in them, so you kind of know carbs. But if you work towards a quarter to a third of the meal, you won't go too far wrong. Uh, protein's great, vegetables are great. It's the bread, pasta, rice, noodles, potatoes you've got to watch. Um, move as much as you can. Um, and if you're not sure, uh, you can get your GP to refer you. There's a, the, the GP can do a piece of paper called a healthcare plan, which is just a bit of paper for, health, for Medicare, and could put a nutritionist on there and an exercise physiologist, and maybe even a, a psychologist motivator to, in terms of finding, you know, getting motivation right, and get a lot of that covered by Medicare, but that has to come through the GP. I can't stress enough, if you have got a diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome, 
lifestyle is the most important thing. Now, if you do suffer from excess hair, acne or scalp hair loss, as I've said, we've got very effective treatments. No woman has to put up with those things. We can effectively treat those conditions. In terms of fertility, don't believe the myth that you'll have trouble getting pregnant. Most women with PCOS have no trouble getting pregnant, especially if they're, they're fit and they're, they're, they have their diet right. Most of them will ovulate so, uh, and will get pregnant. So just to be clear, having just PCOS, it does not equate to infertility. It comes down to how often do you ovulate? And again, in the 90s, when people were looking at uh, how common are these things, they actually found that um, a woman having at least five or six periods a year was completely normally fertile, like all things being equal, like if you married a fertile partner, for example. So you don't have to have monthly periods to be normally fertile. And it, it, it always amazes me how many of my patients who have like three or four periods a year seem to have no trouble getting pregnant. But if they do need help, we've got very effective treatments uh, beyond the lifestyle. Metformin often helps. We have a drug called Clomid. It's largely been replaced by a drug called Letrozole. Very effective. And then we have uh, fertility drugs, and then we have IVF. Actually, most women with PCOS should not need IVF. They, sh they should just need lifestyle, metformin, maybe Letrozole. But the point is, you should be able to have the baby you want. Uh, it's now time for questions. Uh, we'd like you to type them in, and uh, please keep them general and don't make them too personal.